Once again, thank you everyone for being here with us. Uh, so we may have uh, Dr. Murad go ahead uh, and uh, you can start your khutbah. And toward the end, we are going to uh, uh, respond to any questions, comments, feedback you have to offer. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi lameen. وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَمَنْ تَبِعَهُمْ بِرِدْوَانٍ وَدْعَىٰ بِدَعْوَتِهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًّا صَفًّا وَجِيءَ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمَ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ وَأَنَّا لَهُ الذِّكْرَى يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي قَدَّمْتُ لِحَيَاتِي فَيَوْمَئِذٍ لَا يُعَذِّبُ عَذَابَهُ أَحَدٌ وَلَا يُوثِقُ وَثَاقَهُ أَحَدٌ يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي صدق الله العظيم So I know indeed when the earth is pounded pounded to dust when your Lord comes with angels, rows upon rows. On that day when the hell is brought to appear, on that day the man will remember, and what good will that remembrance be? He will say, would that I had sent ahead for this life of mine. On that day he will punish like none other can punish. And he will bind like none other can bind. O oh, content soul, return to your Lord well pleased and well pleasing. Go in among my servants and into my garden. Quran in its rhetorical style excels in creating imagery that is unmatched by any multimedia techniques that we have available in the world today or that has ever existed. It surpasses all of them in the sense that it uses human imagination to build the picture. And anything physical, screen or canvas or graphics is limited by its canvas, by the tools available. But human imagination is unlimited and infinite. And it can conjure images so fast and so vivid that it will take, even with a lot of technique, not possible to be able to present that. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing an image of not this world, but the world that is to come. And that it says, creates a picture of that world of the terror that will be there terror that will surround everyone, terror of what is coming to man. And in that environment and terror, it calls out a content soul. O oh, content soul, return to your Lord, well-pleased and well-pleasing. Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki. 
So what I want to discuss today is that while this verse immediately conjures an image in our mind that is not of this world, but there are numerous scholars who discuss the fact that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls someone with the address of Ya Ayyatuhan Nafsul Mutmainna, then that quality of tamania, that quality of contentedness, that quality of being at rest, at peace, at tranquil, is not just something that a person will suddenly acquire when he will be raised before Allah on that day, on that day. But it is calling just like it, he can call Ya Ayyuhal Muslim, Ya Ayyuhal Mu'min, or he can call Ya Ibadi. He's calling people of a particular characteristic. And that particular characteristic of those persons is Nafsul Mutmainna. And that nafsul mutmainna is a quality that is, it ascribes to certain person that they will raise up. So just like you cannot die a disbeliever and be raised as a believer, you cannot die as someone who is not nafsul mutmainna and then be raised on the day of judgment as nafsul mutmainna. So it's a quality of this world and not the next world. And there are more than one Mufassireen who have taken this view that the, the address of Nafsul Mutmainna applies to this world as well as the next world. And so this tamania, this contentedness, this free of panic, uh, that will be the quality of those who will be raised in Akhira is also the a quality that belongs to believers in this world. That regardless of what happens around you, regardless of what circumstances Allah takes you through, that you will never lose your cool, that you will never be panicked, that you will never be driven to actions that come about as a result of irrational responses that are uh, that are that are that are created through that panic and there are numerous examples of that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes examples of believers in this world in the time of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as to how they dealt with situations and circumstances that would be of extreme panic for their times. So in the battle of Fahud, when believers came back injured and defeated and, and disappointed, and finally they felt that the danger has gone and they are, they are somewhat free, immediately they are given the news that there are people who are coming back to attack. And so Quran presents us that picture before us. In Surah Al Imran, it says, Alladina qala lahumun nasu inna nasa qad jama'u lakum fakshawhum fazadahum imanahum wa qalu hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Then, when it was said to the people that there are people who are gathering, fakshawhum, so you should be fearful now that what is coming. So the Quran says, Fazadahum imana, it increased their iman. Waqalu hasbun Allah, hasbun Allah wa al And so Quran describes that example of, of, of how believers will deal with situations that should bring about a reaction of panic in normal circumstances to any normal human being. Also, if you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, although the whole Surah was revealed, it is described, it is believed in Medina, and it's a, it is labeled as a Medinan Surah. But almost all scholars agree that the last verses of the Baqarah were revealed in Mecca during the time of extreme persecution, uh, when they didn't see any hope 
of how to come out of that situation and circumstances. And in that situation and circumstances, they are taught a prayer. And that prayer says, Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala lazina min qablina. So the only thing they are asking Allah is not to make this pain greater than what they are able to bear. And Quran also describes the quality of munafiqeen, the hypocrites, that whenever they see any noise around them, anything is rising up, any disturbance they see, they say, they, they believe that it is all coming to get them. Yahsabuna kulla sayhatin alayhim. Sayha is a word that Quran uses. It literally means a, a cry, a call. But it uses for people who are punished in this world, that when punishment came to them, and it describes about the coming of the day of judgment as illa wahida. They will only see it as one big noise. And so the among about the munafiqeen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yahsabuna kulla sayhatin alayhim. And so it creates before us a picture of a believer, of a Muslim who is undisturbed by whatever circumstances he faces in the world based on his trust and his faith and his belief in Allah. And that is the greatest source of being calm, being tranquil, not becoming restless. Because if you truly believe that no one else in this world has any power except Allah, that truly no one else can be of any help except Allah, and you truly believe that Allah is just, Allah is merciful, then you cannot be disturbed by whatever is happening around us. So that's the, that's the quality of a believer that will come about not just through this one verse, but I think many different places in Quran for which we don't have time to repeat every single verse. Uh, Quran describes a quality of believers who are at peace with themselves, who accept who they are, and are able to deal with this world in a calm, cool fashion, and not be disturbed, not be, be um, uh, becoming restless and, and not becoming, coming into a panic in a way that it becomes impossible for them to deal with whatever they are facing. But having said that, I just want to clear one misconception in this regard, which is oftentimes you hear that tawakkul on Allah relying on his and trusting Allah means you should not worry about anything. That, that you, should, you can be reckless, you don't have to take any precautions or do anything to safeguard yourself because Allah is the one who is going to save you. And this goes into the depths of our understanding of what, the, what taqdeer is, what destiny is, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that destiny for us and how we, we comprehend the whole concept of destiny, that what is written, what does it mean when, when it is said that something is written. And so I think the, one of the best uh, writings that I found very profound in my readings is, is the great Indian uh, subcontinent scholar, Shah Waliullah his great book, Hujjatullah al-Baligha, in that he discusses this whole concept of taqdeer. And so he divides taqdeer into two, uh, two uh, 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 parts. The first part is he calls it taqdeer mulzim that you cannot escape. And that taqdeer mulzim is when you are born, who your parents are, what the color of your skin is, what you look like, what circumstances you, you find yourself physically in, that's not in your control. You did not choose 
the time or place or house to be born with. And, and so that is beyond you and there's no way you can control that aspect of your creation. That's how you are and that's how you were created. The second part of the taqdeer he calls taqdeer e mubrim. And that taqdeer e mubrim is something that you make as you move forward. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you choices and based on the choices you make, you determine what the outcome will be towards the end. So that is a taqdeer that is being constantly being written. In the same way that Umar ibn al-Khattab used to say that nothing changes a person's taqdeer like a dua does. And, and it, is the, it is a similar concept that comes into that. One of the ways I tend to explain it is if, if uh, those of you who are familiar with computer programming, or even if you're not familiar with computer programming, if you know what a computer game looks like. A computer game is a complex program in which a complex set of if and else loops are programmed. And in that else and if, else, if loops, you try to play that game. And depending on what choices you make as you're playing that game, you score in that game. You can score high, you can score low, you can win, you can lose. Uh, and it is your, it's, it's your choices that determine whether you win or you lose. But at the same time, that game is a program that is pre-written. It is pre-written by a programmer, programmed with all the if and else loops that are possible in, that, in the context of that game. And then it determines, your action determines what you will see and what you will face. So I think that being a, a, a part-time programmer, I thought that uh, that metaphor explains very well as to how Shavalillah described taqdeer as taqdeer e muzim and taqdeer e mubrim. And so that's how we should place our trust in Allah. That is the definition how Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught believers what tawakkul al Allah means and that means you need to make the right choices as you face the circumstances and situations in the world. You cannot free yourself of it. And you cannot just make a, a statement that uh, uh, we will deal with whatever is written for us and whatever Allah has decided for us is going to happen no matter what. Whatever Allah has written will happen no matter what, but what Allah has written is connected with the choices that we make in this world. And that is the whole understanding of when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us to do something, then that means we have a choice to do it. If we were forced into it, then his invitation means nothing. So that's just a side explanation of taqdeer in the context of a believer not being uh, affected and panicked by whatever he sees around us, around him. But he does chart a strategy as a plan, as a way to go through that thing. The, the next thing I wanted to cover is that, that quality of ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutmainna, like many other qualities of taqwa and qualities of a good person, oftentimes we associate them with a person who is given it and some person who are not given it. Taqwa is something we, we associate with person, he's some, someone, some person is muttaqi. It's muttaqi because Allah has enabled him to be muttaqi and it's not something that possible for me to reach that level of taqwa because I'm not at that level, I'm not there. And so the same thing with the, the nafsul mutmainna that it is a quality that belongs to certain people that is inherent in how Allah has created them. And as if Allah has created me differently from them, and that the quality of nafsul mutmainna is something that is arbitrarily assigned to people. We think about this when we think about taqwa as well. And so that taqwa, itminan, tamaniya, and all the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the believers, these are all acquired qualities, not inherent qualities. 
you need to work, need to, to do, need to exert yourself to be able to get to a level which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to achieve. And so whole of the Quran is a program for us to achieve those qualities. That is what the whole process of tazkiyah or purification in Quran and in the Islamic uh, uh, literature is about, is to apply that process of tazkiyah to be able to reach the, those levels which are associated with muttaqeen, which are associated with, with the nasul mutmainna, which are associated with those who will be in the highest level with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And so Allah has placed the means to get to those levels within us. And if, if only we, we don't take time to achieve what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to achieve, uh, we will never get there. And if someone is able to get there, it's not because he automatically got it or that it was something inherent in him, but it definitely means that that person has worked on it throughout his life to be able to get that level, that taskia. And so all the rituals of ibadat, fasting, prayer, zakat, all the things that are obligatory and enjoined upon us, if we just do them simply with the spirit with which they are enjoined and not as a result of thinking that it's an obligation that we need, we want, we need to fulfill, then all those things are helpful in us acquiring those qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed with us, for, for us. The first and foremost, I think, is our connection with Quran. Quran is a book that counsels human mind from beginning to the end. Quran is not a book of do's and don'ts. Quran is not a book of law. Quran is a book that speaks to man and corrects his thinking, changes his behavior, affects his emotions, affects how he thinks, affects how he interprets the world in which he finds himself. And so, connection with Quran, a constant connection with Quran, a daily connection with Quran, a connection with Quran that is meaningful in which you are emotionally involved when you are reciting Quran is important part of developing those qualities that Quran has enjoins upon us, that Quran calls us to acquire. Also, it's a daily fight against one's nafs. Nafsul mutmainna is not something that will come about as a result of certain magical words or certain magical actions that we do. But nafsul mutmainna is something for which we have to work for. That we need to fight with our nafs in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ الْآخِرَةِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْحَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَعْوَى that to recognize your place before your creator in this world. And then to work on denying your nafs what Allah has prohibited. And you may think there is no connection between that and your restlessness that you find that you are facing the world. Your restlessness in this world is the result of your sins, of your wrongdoings, of your condition of your heart. And that condition of heart can only be uh, purified and enhanced as a result of purifying your thoughts, purifying your actions in a way that you refrain from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself points out that it is harmful to you. It's not good for you. Don't try to find excuses and said that it's okay to do this, or, or it's okay in my situation and circumstances. So that whole process of tazkiyah, of taming your nafs, and especially now that we have begun the month of Shaban and month of Ramadan is coming. And although in many ways, 
is unprecedented. I cannot find in history books any time period in history when prayers, collective prayers, tawaf in Kaaba, Hajj, Umrah, all of these, those things were suspended to the level that they are done right now. But I think we should also look at the good side of it. Atikaf is, a, is an ibadah that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to indulge in, in every month of Ramadan. And he, he used to do it even outside of it for different periods and times. I think this whole system that has been imposed upon us today in the society enables us to take great advantage of it in this world which is so fast moving that doesn't give you time for anything else, doesn't give you time to focus on yourself, focus on yourself where you are free from obligations to do what you are needed to do in the society to a very large extent, that you are unable to fulfill those duties and those responsibilities. So we should take advantage of that and think it provides us as a, it's a great opportunity to involve in the process of tazkiyah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us to and says, Qadaf laha man tazakka. Uh, the one who is able to do that taskia is successful. And we, in, and we take ourselves through that process of taskia, then we will be able to acquire the state which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes and calls his servants on the akhirah as ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutmainna, a content heart, a content soul that is able to deal with whatever is thrown at it. So aqulu qali hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'il muslimina fa astaghfiru innu huwa al-ghafur rahim So I was given 25 minutes, so I think I've covered that 25 minutes now. Well, thank you. Jazakum Allah khair, Dr. Ahmad Murad. Uh, those of you who are not aware, you were listening to um, our <coughs> beloved Dr. Ahmad Murad. He is a khatib uh, and uh, I guess a freelance imam in Chicago area. And he, for several years now, he is also currently serving as the chairman at the University of Management and Technology in Pakistan. Um, he has also served um, as a lecturer at various Islamic colleges and, and institutions within the Chicago land area uh, for several years now. He has been associated with Sound Vision uh, since its inception. And in the past, he also uh, served as a vice president of Sound Vision. He still helps us, alhamdulillah, with uh, various IT roles. So thank you, uh, Dr. Murad. At this point, uh, if any of you have any questions, any comments, any feedback you'd like to share, you're more than welcome to share that with us. And I think there's a question that you have already seems answered. Um, was there one historical case since the inception of Islam when daily congregational prayers and Friday prayer were suspended due to any crisis? Uh, I cannot remember one right now. I cannot think of one. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of it. Right mm. yes. okay. Thank you for sharing that. If somebody wants to ask a question verbally, you can do that as well. You will have to raise your hand um, and we'll allow you to speak. Uh, because there is somebody asking, can I personally say salam to Dr. Murad? You're more than welcome to, if you like verbally, otherwise we can convey that. Okay. Well, uh, so allow Dean, he's my close friend of mine. From okay, good. So we'll let you talk. Go ahead, brother Alauddin. You, oh no, sorry. This is brother Abdul Aziz. I'm sorry. Brother Abdul Aziz, you have a question. So you are more than welcome to ask, um, but you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Okay, maybe there's a problem. If, okay, brother. Um, okay. As alaykum. So, brother Abdul Aziz, go ahead. Yes, I, I could not hear the Sheikh answer for the written question. Uh, okay. There was a plane flying over the head of my, you know. Oh, no problem. House, so Can you respond to that? The same question we just asked Dr. Murad about. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, what question was it? Sorry. You know the one we just asked about whether uh, the history. No, I'm history. not. As I, I think I mentioned it in my talk. Uh, I'm not aware of historically this uh, large-scale global uh, suspension of Juma and, and suspension of uh, of uh, Tawaf and suspension of Hajj and Umrah uh, at this scale at this level ever in our history. Uh, so that's th this is uh, truly unprecedented. All right. but, but, but the companions have done, taken decisions in times of crisis to suspend certain things. For example, the, the best example is the hudud by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, don't ever cross, cross them. Uh, in times of famine, in times of war, in times of disturbances, the, the Khulafa made the decision, Khulafa Rashidin, that, uh, that they will suspend hudud during those times. Uh, and those are deal with the society issues. So uh, there is precedent, pre precedent for suspending something that is obligatory, uh, but there is no precedence that I am aware of that at this scale, at this level, um, ibadat and everything was suspended ever in our history. Yeah, I know the punishment for, uh, for stealing was suspended by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. I was, I was wondering if there is a case like that in case of prayer. So Jazakallah khair. Barakallah khair. Thank you for asking. Um, okay, so we have a couple other hands here. Um, so we will have now Brother Alauddin go ahead and talk, please. You're going to have to unmute yourself. I, I just don't want to take time of all of the group listening. It was just a personal loud system. Ahmad Bhai, you can call me later if you want to. Yes, inshallah, I will call you. Inshallah, assalamu alaikum. Barak salam thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think there's a question on the chat. Yes. So the question is about, uh, can if someone is ill and bedridden, how do they go about making wudu before praying? Okay, so in Islam, there is an exception to everything that is required. Uh, in the Sharia, there is an exception to everything. You are only required to do as much as it is within physical possibility to do. So uh, if a budu is not possible, tayammum is possible. Even if tayammum is po not possible, you can just uh, symbolically indicate that you are doing tayammum and, and, and entering into a state that's also possible. So, so it, there's no I mean, whatever Allah has put demands on us, it is connected with our physical ability to be able to fulfill that, that demand. Uh, when we are physically unable to fulfill any of those demands, then the obligation is not upon us to fulfill those demands. Um, this is a general rule in Sharia. Uh, there's exception to everything. Even those things that are haram become halal under si certain situation and circumstances. Uh, uh, when there is no other choice available. Yeah. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah khair. There are two, three questions about virtual Juma. We'll, before we get to that, there is uh, another hand by Brother Kaleem Farooqi. Uh, please go ahead. Brother Kaleem, please, uh, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. If not, then that's okay. We'll move on to another question. Right, Brother Kaleem. Right. Looks like you have a good number of friends joining you, Dr. Yeah. Murad, today. Yeah. <laughs> MashaAllah. Okay, so there are a few questions, related questions related to Juma. Can Juma prayer be done in a congregation of two to three people at home in the current situation? Um, another question is, uh, if we are not doing two rakah Juma, do we just do four rakah Zuhur? Um, yeah, outside of the Juma, even in, in regular days, if you miss Juma and you arrive in Masjid, then, then you will do Zuhur for Raqqa. So Juma is the name of congregational prayer. It's not an obligation uh, individual. And so uh, when you do individually, it's a Zuhur prayer. Juma is a substitute for Zuhur prayer. And if Juma is, is missed, then the default is Zuhur prayer. And so, uh, yes, you will pray Zohar prayer uh, uh, and not pray Turaka for Juma. And uh, people also say that the khutbah of Juma is a 
is, is covers for the two rakas that are less in the actual congregational prayer. But that's just a, a, a opinion and not something that is proven through any, uh, any nas. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if Brother Kaleem still has to... Yeah, assalamu as alaikum warahmatullahi It's such a pleasure and honor to see Dr. Ahmed Murad, mashallah. You really inspired me with your reminder. Yeah, it is a, it is a very memorable, uh, you know, recall when you came to drop me at the airport in Chicago many years. Zakallah khair. Thank you. Zakallah khair. Um, there is a comment uh, or question, I guess, uh, I'm saying, can you, uh, can you please talk about the virtual Juma? Uh, khutbah, virtual Juma khutbah and prayers. So I'm not sure what's the actual question, but uh, if you have something to say about it, go ahead, please. I mean, virtual, there's no such thing as virtual Juma. I um, mean, uh, Juma has to be in a place where people can gather uh, with its proper obligations. Uh, but uh, I think uh, just like we take uh, advantage of many modern technologies and modern concepts, uh, you, uh, virtual Juma is where we are trying to make up and substitute for what is being missed to whatever extent is possible. And so in that extent, uh, at every Juma, people go and listen to Khatib and, and are reminded to be connected with Allah, to be reminded of their faith, to be reminded of their obligations. And so that is that has been suspended at a very uh, mass scale all over the world now. And I think this is a good attempt to try to uh, uh, make up for, for that deficiency that we have in our lives right now. And so Juma is not a Sharai replacement of Juma or Juma Khutbah. But it is a something that we are using to 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 reduce the the deficiency that we face as a result of the situation and circumstances. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think a comment. Uh, Salam alaikum. The verse uh, two hundred and fourteen in Surah Al Baqarah gives us hope in this time. Um, I'm, I don't have the verse in front of me, so if you have it, you're more than welcome to check it out. Otherwise, you know, we can park it for some other time, inshallah. Verse 214, Surah Baqarah. I mean, you know, the whole Quran is, gives us hope uh, in many ways. Um, but obviously certain verses affect us in different ways and under different situations and circumstances. Sometimes you're reading Quran and you've read the same verse thousands of times before and suddenly it dawns upon you that this is a new meaning of that verse. Mm. Uh, well, actually he, the person has uh, posted the translation, so if you want, I can read it. Yes, go ahead. Or do you think that you will enter paradise while such trial has not ended yet, has not yet come to you, sorry, um, as as came to those who passed before you, they were touched by poverty and hardship, were shaken until and shaken until even their messenger uh, and those who believed him said, "When is the help of Allah?" And unquestionably, the help of Allah is near. So, thank you for sharing that. Aya with us. Um, there are a couple more questions, comments coming in. So let's take those up, inshallah. One is. If this social distancing is continuing definitely, uh, or yes, indefinitely, um, or say for six months, are we still going to suspend congregational prayers, including Fridays? Well, see, at the moment, it's not in our hands. It's not, we are not the ones who can decide. Uh, it's, it has to be decided for the whole society, for the whole, uh, our political structure that through which we govern ourselves in society. Uh, that is responsible for it. And, and those decisions uh, sometimes could be mistaken, sometimes could be right, but we have no choice but to obey and follow uh, those decisions. Uh, because each one of us is not an expert and each one of us is not in a position in which he can uh, make those decisions. Uh, so yes, I, I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm not responsible for opening any masjid uh, in the world. Uh, so 
there's not a decision that I can make or, or we together can make. It's a decision that belongs to the people who are in those positions. But whatever uh, the case may be, whatever uh, injunction comes down through, through the civil uh, society, civil government, uh, must be observed and obeyed under all circumstances. And, and, th and th I think Sharia has provision for obeying civil rules and laws in the society. So we must always observe them. Um, I'm reminded of a time when uh, I think you may have already heard it because the thing is going around, but uh, I'm reminded of a time when uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab faced a situation where Syrian army was, I mean, Muslim army was on the fronts in Syria and the plague afflicted them. And so he was supposed to send help in to help them out. And so uh, he made a decision to not send the help out to that army. And also he instructed them not to come back. And so uh, the, the, a great Sahabi, Ubaidullah ibn al-Jarrah, um, a very great Sahabi, uh, uh, objected. He said, he said, Afararum min qadarillah, are you trying to run away from the destiny that Allah has written for you? And uh, uh, so Umar ibn al-Khattab responded by nafirru min qadarillah ila qadarillah. We are running away from one destiny to another destiny. And then he explained that, which uh, this, that explanation, I haven't seen everyone quoting that explanation of it. He said, if you take your sheep to herd uh, into a valley and you see, you see one side is green, the other side is barren, relying on the qud in the destiny of Allah, Qadr Allah, would you go to the, which side will you go to? And uh, uh, obviously you're going to go to the green side, you're going to go to the barren side and say, I'm going to trust Allah and he's going to provide me when I get there. And so that's an explanation he made. I think that's a beautiful explanation uh, that Umar ibn Khattab made. So we have to make decisions based on worldly factors and whatever the worldly factors uh, tell us to do, uh, from medical perspective, from civil perspective, from safeguarding, not us, others, it's is important to do that. The last thing that I think people are learning in this very individualistic society around us today, uh, very selfish society, is that it is not enough that I am able to save myself anymore. Unless the person next to me, person in front of me saves himself, takes precautions, I'm not safe. And so you cannot, I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, grave situation and circumstances in which we must take care and we cannot take responsibility of going around and, and hurting other people based on our own understanding of whatever uh, we think is, is, is obligatory upon, upon it. And I, I think this morning I saw a graph when it so shows that if every person infects just 1.5 other persons compared to everyone is infect 2.5 other persons. And the difference at the end of three weeks was huge. Just by a difference that you are only affecting, instead of one person, you are one and a half person, you're affecting two and a half persons. So I think we should take care. We should observe whatever is imposed upon them through the civil society. And we must adapt ourselves to live in confirmation of whatever is there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Murad, for answering all these uh, questions um, to the point and very good advice you're, you have given us, very practical. Um, I guess we'll just take, I'll just respond to a couple of things, questions that are coming up, and we have addressed them in the last um, few Juma or sorry, khutbah, virtual khutbah webinars as well. And that is people asking, should we pray two rakat or four rakat today? Um, and, and sorry, I was going to actually announce right at the beginning um, of Q&A that we are requesting everybody to pray four rakat of Zuhur at home and uh, ideally with your family, you can pray in Juma with your family at home, uh, but it's not two. This is not a replacement of Juma as Dr. Murad also mentioned. This is not a replacement of uh, our weekly Juma gatherings. We are not praying collectively right now. This is just a virtual khutbah reminder instead of physical khutbah that you listen to on Fridays. But salah is, uh, still has to be prayed, and that is not going to be two rakat of Juma typically that we do together. 
it is going to be four rakat of Zuhur prayer. So please make sure whatever time zone you're in, whenever Zuhur kicks in, please make sure by now you should have prayed or should be praying four rakat. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else, Dr. Murad, you'd like to say in conclusion before we uh, wrap up? Thank you, Jazakallah Khair, and may Allah keep all of us safe. And may Allah enable us to make ourselves better human beings, better believers out of this crisis that we are facing. Ameen. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah feekum. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, please uh, check out Sound Vision Facebook as well as our YouTube channel by later tonight um, on Sound Vision Foundation YouTube channel where you can find all three virtual khutbahs from today and two virtual khutbahs from last Friday as well as all our webinars. Um, and uh, you can sign up for the upcoming ones um, on soundvision.com forward slash webinars. And last but not least, please remember uh, your Juma Sadaqa and Juma donations. Um, uh, uh, make sure you remember Sound Vision as you leave today as the end, uh, Juma day ends. So please uh, go to soundvision.com to make your contribution. Also, please keep remembering um, your local masjid as well as your um, uh, relief organizations and any social service organization that is and human rights organizations that are serving our community. Make sure we remember them virtually through your donations as well as any other ways you can help. Barakallah feekum. Inshallah, we look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi